Sound design. Yeah. All right, so how do you build Dave Rat's adjustable in-fire arc subwoofer array? So that's what I'm gonna talk about in today's video and how I deconstructed it. And I'm also gonna talk about my birthday. Today's my birthday. My dad sent me an electric yodeling pickle. So if you wanna hear what that sounds like, you have to wait till the end of this video. So when I did the interview with Dave, he was talking about this and I was trying to picture it, but I was like, number one, you usually don't do an in-fire array with only two elements. And number two, I've never heard of combining an arc with an in-fire. It just sounded really weird. So I had to do a lot of work in Map XT to try and figure out what he was talking about. Um, here's the article. I just did this design in SketchUp so you could kind of see what it would look like. Um, because what we're going to be looking at today in Map XT are all two-dimensional designs like this. It's sort of hard to imagine. So keep this picture in mind as we're going through this. So where did I start? I started in Merlin Van Veen's Subwoofer Array Designer just to get some of my first numbers, some restrictions, some limitations for the design. So I started with an in-fire array. I started with 1.9 meter spacing, which I had already defined in the article here. Um, and that's basically just quarter wavelength of this uh, of 45 hertz, which is the number that Dave specified in his design. So he wanted a null at 45 hertz in the back of the array. Great, so that's what we have. You can see it in the prediction down here. Um, and it says right here, first cancel 45 hertz. I wanted to go through these steps though to see where are the preferred filters. Okay, 30 and 60 hertz. So I'll go ahead and put those in. Now I'll move on to the physical horizontal array, which is here. So one of the things that Dave talked about was making the speakers go wider out in the arc for uh, a wider coverage and closer in for a narrow coverage. And I'm not very experienced with arc arrays, so I was like, okay, how far can those go apart? Well, I know it should be two-third wavelength for maximum um, distance from each other, but I don't know ex how exactly that's going to work out. So I wanted to look at that here in um, the calculator. And so what I did down here in the bottom, sorry this doesn't really all fit on the screen, is I'm basically looking at these polar plots. I'm going to turn up the distance between the subwoofers until the pattern starts to fall apart, and that's when I'll know, okay, that's the maximum distance. So I could just start putting numbers in here. Let me set this back to zero. I could just start putting numbers in here in the spacing until I find that, and that is one way that I did it. Um, but I could also look at two-third wavelength and one-third wavelength. So let's talk about that. So what I want is the first the wavelength of 60 hertz because that's where the top of my range is here. So if I look at this guy, pretty much its operational range is going to be from uh, 30 to 60 hertz. Okay. And okay, so I get that wavelength and then I multiply that by two thirds. And that gives me this 12.5 number. Now that's in feet, so we'll divide by 3.281 to get 3.8 feet, uh, sorry, meters. And at first I put that number in and I thought, great. But then I looked down here at these polar plots and I was like, oh, wait, this is a little bit too much. I want something a little bit cleaner because I don't know exactly how this is going to work out with the in-fire combination. So let me start out with something clean that doesn't have any of this these side lobes coming off of there. Um, so although two-thirds wavelength is probably the maximum there, um, I don't want any of this stuff happening. So Let's go with one-third wavelength. So let's go back over to my calculator here. I wish I could just go back in time. Maybe I can. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. I never noticed this before. Can I just click on this? Yes, cool. And can I click here? Um, sort of. One-third. Uh, 6.287 divided by 3.281. 1.91 meters. 1.91, okay, and this looks better down here, right? So uh, these polar patterns I'm looking at here are at 29, 45, 50, and 60. 
and they all look really good. Um, they actually look a little bit too good. Um, what's going on here? Oh, that's because I only have two of them. Okay. I'm actually supposed to have three of them. There we go. Okay, so this is one I want to look at, um, is that this, my highest number here, 60 hertz, is this one right here. And it does do this figure eight pattern, but it doesn't start to have these side lobes that I didn't want. The next thing I did is basically just start increasing this arc angle until uh, these numbers down here, the opening angle, were no longer usable. And basically for me, if it goes up to 360 degrees, then don't have any really any control anymore. So I wanted to see how far I could go with this. And you know, I started with something like 20, and sorry, I have to keep jumping around. This monitor is kind of small. So I'm looking at the number 45 hertz here. So I can actually, do these turn these off? Yeah. Since I'm really focusing on 45 hertz with this whole thing, then um, I was really just looking at that number for the opening angle. Yeah, because uh, 29 hertz is already at 360 degrees. So I'm not going to really worry about that. But I will look at 45 hertz. And I basically brought this up as high as I could. You can see that this uh, arc angle is getting bigger. And over here, I'm up to 144 degrees, which is pretty high. 120 degrees gives me an opening angle of 160 degrees. 176, so I think this is the end of it. Okay, 176, once it gets to 180, then it's just gonna flip to 360. Okay, so there it goes to 360. So um, 125 degrees was the maximum angle that I wanted to use there. So that's how I did these initial designs. And then I think I just went down here and clicked Export to Map Online Pro. And this is where I've got my InFire Array, these two guys, and then the Arc Array all combined. This was my first attempt. And if we look at the whole thing in... Do you want to look at the rear? Yeah, let's look at the rear. What I found in my first attempt here, looking at this microphone in the rear, is that I have a null here at 51 hertz. And that's not where I wanted it. I wanted it at 45 hertz down here. So I said, what's the problem? I had to play around with it and look around for a little while, but I finally discovered that this guy to this guy, then yes, that's 6.28 feet offset, which is what I want for the in-fire array. But when I rotated these side speakers in the arc all the way around, now they're, this one's a lot closer, something like three feet closer. So this is, and there's two of these. So in terms of average phase, they really start to pull the whole thing. And that's why the null ended up being up here. So I said, okay, let me redesign this. So let's open up version two. And how did I figure this out? So I drew this triangle here so I could show you my work. And here's the deal. So I want the distance between these two lines here. And let me draw these so you can see them better. I want the dif distance between difference between this line and this line to be 6.28 feet. But how do I figure that out with just like moving them around over and over and over again? So I opened up a triangle solver here. And if you just type in right angled triangle calculator in Google, you'll get this thing. And if I solve for B, which is not this line here, but if you draw another line that goes all the way back to right under here, okay? Now we have this triangle. So if I cut this, see this triangle? That's what's going on here. And when I put in all of my dimensions, then I figured out that, hey, this B number here needs to be 111.16 feet. And that is how then I got the position for this. And then I just changed these other subwoofers relative to that position. So. I'm not going into a lot of detail there, so let me know if you want more information about that. Um, but I used that triangle solver to figure out how far, how much farther forward these subwoofers needed to go so that the offset between the rear sub 
and the side subs is 6.28 feet and um, not this guy here. Okay, and that moved my null down here closer to 45, which is where I wanted it. And let me show you how I optimize this because this is the same way that you would do it in the field. So I solo this speaker up. I'll take my front measurement microphone, store that, and then I will take all of these guys together and make sure that average together that they line up here in the phase, right? So that then when everybody plays together, we get summation through their operating range. So this blue guy here now is summation. And then I could just take a look in the rear and see where is that cancel at, and there it is. Um, the only other optimization thing that I didn't touch on yet is the level setting. So I think I did the level setting in the rear since that's where I wanted to optimize the cancellation. So measuring the rear sub, this time from the rear, um, store that then measure the front subs. This time I'm looking at the level, so this is where I got that level offset that you see here, minus, uh, about minus 8 dB, because when these arrive 180 degrees out of phase in the rear, uh, over here at 45 hertz, I want them to arrive at the same level as well. So matching level, not matching phase, is how you create cancellation. So why are we doing all of this? So what Dave talked about is that he's trying to um, limit the amount of interaction in the middle. So let's take a look at an example of that. So I have one called stereo. So imagine that maybe you have some kind of audience playing here and let me just start with two, these two guys in the rear. So this would, this is gonna do a prediction of your normal left right stack, right? So we've got summation down the middle, and then we've got cancellations here, and then we've got this cancellation that goes like this. If we use this array instead, and you can see that I sort of have them um, aimed out at 45 degrees, and we take a look at that prediction, not only have we gotten rid of a lot of inf information back here in case there's you know, um, some other show going on back here, and also in case we have, you know, a stage here and we wanna get some low frequency energy off the stage, we've reduced the interaction here in the middle a little bit. So if I get rid of these, you can see, you know, I think I have, here we go. So now we can have a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, so here's the old one on the right and here's the new one on the left. And, you know, if we take a look at where this audience might be, you can see the reduced interaction. So, this valley here isn't quite as bad. You can see it fills in here a little bit. Um, and over here on the left where I drew this little triangle, it's widened out a little bit. Now the last part of the article is me sort of wondering to myself, what if I took this same design and flipped it around to be a gradient? Because to me it makes more sense that if you have two elements, it would be a gradient and not an infire. So here's what that design looks like. It actually looks exactly the same. Um, all I did was change the processing. So here now the delay has moved from this channel to this channel and then I reversed the rear sub. And initially when I hit predict, it looks almost exactly the same. The real difference is when we take a look at the measurement here, we now have broadband cancellation here compared to like that null around uh, 45 Hertz that we had with the previous design. Um, the other thing is that there's a null here. Let me get rid of some of these. Um, we do have this null that's happening here, um, but keep in mind that these horizontal lines are 10 dB apart. So if this is 90 up here, then this is 80, 70. So, so we're already down 20 dB by the time we get to this null. Shouldn't be that much of a problem if we're running a linear system. Now, I guess if we have like uh, a huge boost and our subs, we're turning our subs, you know, way up, then this might be another design consideration, but I didn't really go much beyond that. I just wanted to see what the difference would be if I flipped that around and made it a gradient. I've never tried this in the field. I was just playing with it in MapXT because I wanted to see how Dave had done this to try and deconstruct it. If you guys have used this in the field, please let me know. 
I'd love to know what your results are. And now what you've all been waiting for, the electronic yodeling pickle. Sound design. Yeah.